we're busy with a series, and uh, I know that there's so many of you that are at different places. Uh, you're going through different things right now in your life where you're saying, God, I need direction. I need direction in my life right now. I need to know the direction um, where you want me to go. There's some decisions which I have to make. There's some tough um, radical decisions, which some of us have to make major ones. Some of us have to decide what gifts we're going to buy, and it's a big decision. But some of us have to decide, do I stay in the home that I'm in? Do I sell the home? Some of us have to decide, um, you know, uh, he asked me to marry him. Am I going to say yes or no? Um, some of us have to decide um, regarding our health. What are the changes that we need to make in our lives regarding our health. Um, there, there's many different places that each one of us are at. Um, and one of the main things which I've come to realize, and, and I know by now, I hope you get it also, that the place you are right now in a life is ba- in your life, most of it is based regarding the decisions that you've made up to this point. Your decisions matter. Now, I know some things that's happening in your life is not based on the decision that you have made. It's something that happens in this world. And those things, you, you can't control those things. But the situation that you've, uh, you are in, based on the things that's happened in this world, are based upon the decisions that you've made in this world. So, so we can blame the world for what's happening, but the decisions that you've made to get you where you are, either having peace or rest, or having comfort or not, or being in a place of turmoil, a lot of that is, is based on the decisions that we've made ourselves in our lives and where we are right now. And the reality is that all of us, I'm hoping that if we can get godly advice regarding decisions, I'm hoping last week most of you said, yes, if, if there's godly advice, you would take it. If you can have God's advice regarding situations, circumstances in your life, most of us say, yes, I will take God's advice. I will take it. I might not do it, but I will take it. Because just to keep it on the back burner in case my own things don't work out. Um, And the reality is, the Bible is filled with godly advice. The Bible is full of it. There's so much information in the Word um, on every subject, on every matter in our lives. All of our lives is in God's Word. If we we simply take the time and, and we are are submitted to God and take His advice, our lives in many ways would look different. So we're busy discovering, is it possible to know God's will for my life? Is it possible to know what God wants me to do? Because direction really is determined by the source. Who who are you listening to for the direction in your life? Now, if we listen to the the life giver as our source, the the direction that he will give will be life-giving direction. So if your source is the one that leads towards life, you need to know that the instruction he's going to give will be instruction that leads towards life. So for any direction in your life, you can go to him. He's our main source. So here's the thing that I've come to discover over the last few years of being a pastor is that there is a big group of people who do not think People who think that they can't know God's will. It's not possible for us to know God's will. There's people that think that that we can't hear from God regarding His will. We just kind of have to do things. There's such a big group of people that that think, well, well, God is is He's kind of given us this world, and all we have to do is pray and then kind of give up. I've heard prayers of people saying things like, um, um, you know, we can pray in faith, but, but God, if it's your will, then really, um, you know, whatever your will is. So I'm, I'm making a prayer in faith, but then I'm countering my prayer in faith by saying, God, it's maybe uh, it's not your will. So the prayer of faith really doesn't count. We cannot pray prayers of faith unless we know it's within God's will. Do you understand? That like faith, faith cannot get God to move outside of His will. A prayer cannot get God to move outside of who He is. That's not a prayer of faith. That's a prayer of stupidity. Lack of understanding, lack of wisdom. 
I cannot pray for God to move outside how he works. God, I want to win the lottery. <laughs> My dad was so funny. He is, you know... He would go and he's got a system on how he buys lottery tickets in South Africa. And he would pray over his lottery tickets. And I said to him, God, God, Dad, God doesn't want to bless you through lottery tickets. It's, it's not how he works. He's not a gambler. He doesn't work through gambling. Right? But we have to understand God's will and God's ways of doing things. Um, uh, uh, sometimes we struggle because we don't know. You can know God's will. That's the first thing that I want you to know. God, it says, Jesus said, you know, um, the mysteries and the secrets of the world. He's going to make known to us who are his followers. It's not the mysteries and the secrets he's going to withhold from us. He's revealing it to us. To the world, it remains a mystery. But to us, it becomes something that we can build our lives upon. There's some mysteries and secrets which we don't understand yet. But as we continue in our relationship with God, He'll continue to reveal the secrets and the mysteries to us. John 1, 1 John 2 says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers. I love that. Nor the things it offers you. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Here's the thing the world offers. For the world, do not love the world and the things the world offers. And now we're going to hear what the world offers. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. A craving for everything we see and pride in, our achievements and our possessions. So, so he's saying, do not love the things the world offers, for the world only offers these things. Here's what the world offers. Craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. This is what the world offers us. So, so he's saying, do not love what the world offers. So there is a contradiction between the two. These are not from the Father. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And in this world, it is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So there is a contrast be be between the ways of the world, because the, the, the ways of the world will go after the cravings of the world. The ways of God, the life giver, will go after the things that God values. So when I go for advice, there's two sources that I can go to. I can go after the one, the ways of the world, and, or I can go after the one that gives us life. Now some of you are going, but listen, I need stuff. I realize that. I like stuff. I like, uh, I like living in a home and driving in a car and putting on clothes and being able to go somewhere on a holiday. I, I've got no, pro and God has no problem with that. But my love is not in that, that I value that more than God's ways of doing. See, God's ways of doing is, He wants us, remember when the nation came out, He wants us to be dependent on Him. For every day stepping out and eating from him, every day eating, what is it? The manna, the bread of God. Every day eating, feeding on him, dependent on him. But he wants us dependent, interdependent on each other. Where we become the one that supports, encourages, uplifts, upholds, surrounds, warms, um, um, just prays over the people around us. In a world that is craving for possessions and things, you will be clinched. You will not be interdependent. You will not be the one that's willing to say, I will open up my heart to bless um, a family. Because then I can't get any more. The world will tell you, hold back as much as you possibly can in the days of Phanom. The, wor the word tells you, when you know that Phanom's coming, do you know what you have to do? Start blessing people more than you've ever had before. It's an opposite way of doing it. It is a secret, a mystery that is revealed from a father that has a plan and his plan is for life. 
Not for death, not for shortcoming. And because what happened when they did that, and the apostles did that, they, they heard there's a prophetic word that there's going to be, be um, drought and hunger and, and a lack of, of food and supplies for people. So what did the church do? They started doubling their blessing to people around them. And when it came, they had more than enough because they applied a secret and a mystery that was unknown. The world did the opposite. They started reserving and they ran out. So there's a contrast between the world's way and God's way. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So, so we have to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God, to His ways, to His way of doing, for, to His way of every day stepping out, eating the bread, listening to His measurements, His omer, on how much, how do you want me to conduct my life? How do you want me to measure? What are the measurements for my life? Every day submitting, so offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship do not conform to the patterns of this world do not be transformed into the way they do things because if you're going to do that you need to know that you are going to fall short but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you are able to approve what is God's will and so that you can prove to people this is God's will He's, he's good, he's pleasing, and he's perfect will. So we are able to prove what? God's will. If God's will is unknown, it's impossible to prove his will. If we don't know and proclaim to people God has a will, if we don't proclaim to people God's plans and purposes are good, it's impossible for us to prove when good things happen that it's God's will. We have to be able to prove it. Last week we, we, we said the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his ways. I love the, just the imagery of a war horse that is trained so well that by the slightest touch of the hand, the slightest um, poke of the heel, a war horse responds in a mighty and powerful way. They are trained. The word meek does not mean weak. It means a powerful animal that is submitted to the rulership of his master that at the slightest gesture will respond in the appropriate way in the direction that his master leads and conducts him. It says the meek, we are the meek saying, God, I'm going to be so responsive to your ways, to your, to your pulling, to your direction, to, to your promptings. I'm going to be so responsive. And in that response, I'm not growing weak. I'm actually growing stronger. I'm a war horse. I haven't lost any of my abilities. I haven't lost any of this incredible power that you've placed inside of us as people. We are not floor mats. We are war horses that is in meekness submitted to a master who is riding our backs. We've got a father that's not just kind of in a distance saying, okay, war horse, you, you kind of lead yourself. No, he's on you. Holy Spirit is in us, in us, conducting us, steering our heads with slightest gestures. He says, and do not be like the horse, that the only way a, a stubborn horse responds is by, by pulling and jerking, and eventually your mouth bleeds so much because you're not listening to the man. And it's not him wanting to hurt you. It is you being stubborn and your circumstances hurting you because you're not responding to his steering. We have to be meek. Meekness means power and strength under control. So I said, uh, I wanted to show you some scriptures just regarding having, we need to know the will of God. It's important for us to know the will of God. And we did the first one last week. Your sanctification. This is God's will. Sanctification means that there has to be a progressive work of purity that's taking place in our lives. A progressive work. It, it should be, and, and the only way to have a progressive work of purity taking place in our lives means there has to be a progressive evaluation. You have to, in the process, continually evaluate yourself. Not judge yourself. Not to have the church or somebody else judge you, but you yourself, you have to progressively see, am I gaining any ground in specific areas? And if I'm not, it might mean that I'm not in meekness submitted to God, to his leading of his ways in those areas. There has to be a progressive um, evaluating and, and going, okay, God, there's areas. And, and as 
I mentioned it last week, it's like a kid wearing a diaper. Now, I know we don't all start, we don't start with everything. God's got a plan and a purpose for every single one of us, and He has us on a process, and it's the same way He was leading His people out of Israel in freedom. He led them out in freedom, right? They were slaves, now they're free. He didn't give them 10 rules and said, all of you follow these rules exactly. He wanted relationship with them, and He gave them guidance and instruction on how to eat and how to live and how to be alive and how to stay alive, right? It, there was a progression. He started with small. He started with, and his plan was to continue to instruct them for all of their life in every area. But they felt, no, we couldn't do it that way. We can't be that slow. We want everything fixed. Give us 10 rules. We follow the 10 rules. Instead, God wants us in our lives. Don't fall back into that. When Sometimes when people come into the church and they give their life to Christ, we tell them, okay, now stop doing this, 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 and stop doing that, and stop doing that. And then you find. The reality is, it is God who is doing the work. It is not our judgment or our condemnation that will cause those things to make effect in their lives. It is He who has started the work in you. It's faithful and will complete it. Our role as a body is to encourage, uplift, strengthen, speak God's word, God's life into their lives. And as they hear more about Jesus and they fall more in love with Him and they start trusting Him and they they get to the understanding, I can trust God. I can trust his ways. They will start applying the principles themselves as God leads them through it. But there has to be a continual evaluation. Is there something in my life? God, okay, I've been wearing a wet diaper now. I'm 42 years old. It's time to get out of the diaper. It's time to move beyond that. Uh, it's taken, and, it's, and some of us will wear a diaper for 40 years. And at that point, if you're at this place today where you start evaluating yourself, God, there's something else that I need to trust you with. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe you that you can help me through this. This is the next area, the next phase in my life that I want to surrender to you. You surrender it. And you see him, not based on me telling you this is the next one. He'll tell you this is the next step for you. Because I have a plan. I know how it's going to work. And I'm doing it. He's doing it. We don't have to do it. So, so he will work in you to will and do his good pleasure. That's an awesome scripture. It is God who works in you. Isn't it the church that puts it on you? The scriptures should have read that. It is the church that puts on you to do things according to God's good will and, ple- and pleasure. No. It is him, he who works in you. Is it up there? Oh, good. To will and do his good pleasure. First Thessalonians is the following. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. Now, I, I, it's like a mind shift. Let's not be transformed to, to the images of this world, but let's be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we are able to approve and prove what is God, God's good, pleasing, and acceptable will. So, so let's be transformed. The, world, the world's way is stronger discipline will cause us to fall and do the things right. God's way is I trust Him. He has started to work in me. He has started to work in you. I trust Him. He started to work in you. He's, he's got to work in you. And your work and His work is not the same work right now. And yours is not the same work. But the work that he has started in you, he is faithful and able to complete it. So let's not brush everybody with the same brush. He's not doing it. His grace and his mercy is more than enough for those who take 40 years to process through something and some people take one day. Doesn't mean that this this one on 40 years has less grace. He has a whole lot of grace and mercy. The Lord's design is clear and it's made open to us. And he says, I will work it in you. The Lord who began a work in you, he will be, he is able to perform it. Now I want to show you a few scriptures, probably about eight or nine, and we're going to read through them quickly. These scriptures are to show you God's will. For those of you that don't know God's will, here is some awesome scriptures just to show you God's will. This is one of the most known scriptures. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That is a scripture of God's will. I don't know God's will. You know now. 
God's will is to give you plans. He has plans to prosper you and to give you a good future. Meaning, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my life and I know that your will for my life is you want to give me plans of hope and a future. I know your will is not to harm me. Next one. 1 Timothy 2 verse 3. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What is God's will? Some elect few. The ones he's kind of handpicked. I always struggle with, oh, not struggle. I always actually, this is my, one of my favorite arguments with people who come from a Calvinistic viewpoint. And I have it with some of you in the church even. Um, Calvinistic viewpoint is the following, that certain people are selected or elected by God to be part of, of who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. My favorite argument is, you might have picked God, but maybe he didn't pick you. Right? So, so, so who tells you that you are secure in your salvation at all? If you think God only picks a few. And for me, the, this is the, the thing that makes me, when I, sometimes I get into those arguments and I get like, I can get angry because what, what level, I'm sorry if you're here and I know we've had those arguments and I know you are here, so I'm not going to look in your direction. <laughs> I'm going to look down on here. But here it is. What level of arrogance should there be in us to think that I am so special that God picked me and the person next to you, God decided no. Yes, no, 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 yes. He says the following, it's God's desire. It's his plan and it pleases him that people all, some, all, all to be saved. All to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. All. How many people? All. So now, now um, again, I think we can have a tremendous amount of disappointed people when they show well. When they show up to heaven, they're going to be happy. Yeah, I'm in heaven. But then they're going to see people and go, ah, oh, I didn't think you're going to be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ah, it's kind of the you know, two extremes. But uh, <laughs> if you've lost a loved one, if you know a loved one or a friend or a family member, I, I, want to, I want to give you this comfort. The Spirit of God does not stop pursuing up to the last breath, when the last breath is gone, even beyond that, he continues to pursue. He has never given up. He will not give up. When, when the last breath is gone, I believe there are still seconds where he is. I know you're here right now. Choose me. And I am convinced our enemy is going to be very disappointed one day. Because more people are going to choose God than it's going to choose him. So, so um, that, I hope it gives hope to people. First um, Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, this is God's will. Give thanks in all circumstances. It's a secret. It's a mystery. I don't understand how it works. But this is God's will. I'm not going to go to, to the, the world's ways, um, patterns, um, systems. I'm going to go to God's system. And he says, in all circumstances, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Look at what you have and start thanking and praising him for what you have and stop looking at what you don't have or what might have happened. Start praising him and thanking him that you can trust him and you will see your demeanor, your life, your attitude on life, your life giving life, what goes out of you every day. You will see it change. That's God's will. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. 
It's his will. It's not something that the church has put on somebody. It's his will. James 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives, what's God's will? To give generously to all without finding fault. God's not like, um, you want to know what? What? How dumb are you? Like I've told you. He says, he gives without finding fault. You see, it's like sometimes we think we can't go to God with our questions. God said, any question, you can ask me and I'll find no fault in you asking. There's a joke that Saki always tells. And it's funny to us. There's a boy that goes to his dad and he says, Dad, how does the, the, the galaxy work? And the dad says, oh, no, I've got no idea. And the boy says, okay. He says, dad, um, like the sun, is the sun like how, like how hot is the sun? Like, like, will it like burn my skin? If like, how hot is it? Can I touch it? That goes, oh, no, no, I've got, I've got no idea. He says, dad, the moon, does the moon have any heat? And that says, no, I've got no idea. And the son says, uh, dad, I hope you don't mind me asking all these questions. And the dad says, well, how are you going to learn? <laughs> anyway uh, that's, that's kind of yeah I thought it was funny also Proverbs 3 verse 5 says the following trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways submit to him he will make your path straight that's his will He's given us instructions on how to do this. Next one. 1 Peter 2.15. For it is God's will. I love this one. Numa Church, this is what we're doing. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. That's an awesome scripture. We should silence the ignorant talk of God's body. We should silence the ignorant talk of what it means to be a Christian. We should silence the ignorant talk of Jesus and God. And people don't know, your God is just judgmental. He's this and he's... We should silence that. As a body, we should... We, our actions and how we love people should be so loving and so dramatic that the world can no longer have an opportunity to point towards the church and go, you guys are this or that. We will silence their talk with how we love them. That's our mandate. Ephesians 5.15. Be very careful then how you live. Do not, not as unwise, but as wise. Be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Verse 18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. It's His will. He does not say, do not drink wine. He says, do not get drunk on it. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord. Verse 20. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. Giving thanks for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and is His will and will forgive us our sins. And He will do what else? Purify us from all unrighteousness. That's his will. Why is it his will? Because unrighteousness cannot be in his presence. So he cleanses us from all our unrighteousness and all our sins so that we can be in his presence. Psalm 1, we, we've, we've read the psalm of it. We're doing a lot of scriptures today, but I hope all of you are kind of tracking with me. It says, how blessed is the one? How blessed is the, how blessed is the one? 
You're going to see. Who does not follow the advice of the wicked or stands in the pathway with sinners or sits in the assembly of scoffers. Instead, he finds pleasure in obeying the Lord's commands. He meditates on his commands day and night. He is like, this is how blessed he is. He is like a tree planted by flowing streams. It yields its fruit out um, fruit at the proper time, very important. It yields its fruit at the proper time and its leaves never fall off. He succeeds. How blessed is he? The guy who follows God's instructions. He succeeds in everything he attempts. Some few, one or two. He succeeds in everything he attempts. Why? Because he's not following the instruction of the wicked and the unwise. He's following God's instruction. In everything he attempts, certainly the the Lord guards the way of the godly. But the way of the wicked ends in destruction. Now, I I want some of you to hear me this morning. Um, And I know this is going to speak to quite a few of you because this is kind of, there's two, two things in the message that I really feel is important to get. Number one, that I want you to get this morning. This does not say, and all these things regarding God's will, does not say that you're not going to go through hard times. It does not say it's going to be always easy. It, it's not a, a thing that says, listen, you're not going to be, be going through things. God's paths, um, it's not going to cause you to go through things that's going to form character in you. Jesus, when he was baptized in water by John the Baptist, it said the Holy Spirit descended onto him as a dove and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he received power. And then it said the Spirit of God led him into the desert. Now that leading, that is a a strong constraint, a compulsion, a drive. So after he was baptized in water, except he, he was God's son, he came out, the Holy Spirit filled him. The Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. The Spirit actually led him into something that was going to be testing to him. But listen to what he says to Paul. Paul said, Lord, there's this messenger of of Satan that's been sent to buffet me. And he says, God, I've pleaded, I've besought you three times. And it seemed like it wasn't getting anywhere. It seems like I've asked you three times to get rid of it. And it seems like this, it's it's not going away. But the Lord spoke to me and said, this is Paul. He says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. There has no temptation taken you, but such which is common to man. God is faithful. He won't suffer you to be tempted above that what you are able to handle. But the temptations, he'll make a way in every temptation. He'll make a way for you to escape from it and to stand at the end of it. So here's the thing, we're being guided by God, we want to be guarded in His ways. He says, if we, if we don't listen to the advice of the wicked, but we follow His instruction, everything we attempt will be a success. Everything we attempt, He will make prosperous, everything. So, so, so here's the thing, um, does this mean that in attempting it, does He say, um, everything you attempt, I'm going to make easy? Faith is not easy. Faith means I'm applying God's principles, not the world's principles. Faith means that I'm picking up my cross. Don't ever let ease or comfort become the criteria of whether you're walking in good relationship with the Lord. Ease and comfort is not the the check marks to see, yeah, well, I'm in good relationship with God. I know so many testimonies here this morning. I'm a, Michael, I'm, I'm going to use you just as an example. So we know Michael and Shemaine, we love them. We know that God has been guiding and directing their path. We've seen how they've obeyed Him and how their path has been directed and God's leading them. So God led Michael to a new job. And this new job is, is a position that he had many years ago, but now currently it's a, it's a position of stress, especially regarding the season that we are in. Um, he's uh, the... the um, meat manager at thrift 
um, at Thrifty's Food, assistant manager uh, at Thrifty's Food. So here's the thing. It's causing tension and stress for Michael. So Michael came to him this morning and said, you know, I'm feeling anxious. I'm not sure how I can handle it or what I'm supposed to. So in my mind, I'm listening to him, and, and this is me. This is not God speaking yet. This is me, me speaking. Um, saying, thinking, my first advice to you is going to be, Michael, just leave the job. If it's causing stress, go back to your old one. But then as I'm busy talking to him, I'm asking God, what is your instruction that you want? What's the words that you want, want me to give him? So the first thing he said to me, ask him, did I lead you there? So I said, Michael, do you believe that God led you to this job? Yes. Now, in this season that you are in, we are going to go through seasons that are difficult and hard. But in this season, God is busy forming and shaping character and abilities in you that you are more capable and ready for the next season that's coming. Not saying that the next season is going to be harder. But in the next season, you are going to have a testimony and a witness of what you've just gone through. So that you are able to affect and encourage other people that might be going through the same season. Saying, did God lead you there? Yes. This is what's happened in my life. God led me to something. And man, I was at a point where I felt this is too much. And then I got to the place where I'm saying, God, I trust you. I know you will not place me in this place if you don't think I can handle this through you. So I trust that I can handle this through you. So when it gets hard, I'm going to stand on the fact that I trust my father. I trust him. He knows me better than I know me. I trust him. He led me here. He equipped me to stay here and to do the job and to get through this and even have a promotion beyond it. We have to have that understanding that it's not always going to be easy. Ease is not, when we came here from South Africa, and you know, we don't, I don't always want to reference our story. So we came from a place where we, we had more than enough finances, felt that God called me here. Um, because I had no visa, I couldn't work. So the only work I could do was illegal work. Um, um, so I had to go, <laughs> this is not recorded. No, so I had to go pick, uh, pick um, um, cucumbers um, in, in fields in the mornings and, and picking, you know, coming from a place where, where my, my sense of gardening was move that tree there. And then I've, if people ask me, what did you do today? I'd say I gardened. I told the gardener to move the tree there, right? So that was my idea of, of working in the field and coming from a different place. But then seeing how God, through all of this, said to me, you can trust me. Do you trust me? You know, do you trust me to know that I've got you back? And every single step of the way, was it easy? Can I say to you, listen, it was easy? No, it wasn't easy. But would I change anything in the process? Yes, lots. <laughs> I would, if I have to be honest. I would like for him not to lead me to a desert, lead me to a town. Or to a, like a village at least. But I've come through this and I look back and I can point to every single place where it is supernatural provision. Not natural. Supernatural. Last part of this message, which I'm going to really quickly skip to. And this is a question which I think many of you have. How do I get direction from God? How do I get direction from God for my life? Well, what is the process? Number one, it's complicated. Number one, you ask Him. It's the first thing. You ask Him. And number two, you wait until He tells you. But, but I've asked Him, and He hasn't said anything. Wait. But he hasn't said, I need to know right now. Wait, there has not been a moment in time where God has not responded on time. He's never, he's never missed a deadline. But here's the thing. He said, in all things, I want you to acknowledge me. Now, this is kind of, it, it's, so, it's so simple, but it is so powerful. It is simple but powerful. And here's the simple thing about it. In all things, acknowledge me. In all things, acknowledge me. Sometimes we pray for the big things. 
right? God, we pray for souls to be saved. We pray for our community to be reached. We, we pray for um, the world to, to become a better place. We pray for leadership. We pray for big things, right? We pray for, but God says, in all things, acknowledge me. In the smallest detail, I, and, and I wrote this, this on, the, on the thing. Um, I'm not sure where it is on my slide now, but I'm going to find it. God will only involve himself where he is invited into involvement. The Lord wants us to exercise our own will to draw upon his promises to come into our lives and to acknowledge saying, Father, I need you. He will only involve himself where our will says, God, I want you in it. That's everything. That's everything. From the smallest detail to the biggest one. I'm, I told you this testimony. I was digging um, holes at, at our house because we had to put in new sewage pipes. And I'm just busy digging away, digging away with an excavator, three feet deep. I have to go quite deep. And if not for one moment that I stop and think about gas lines. Um, didn't, didn't think about it for a, didn't even consider gas lines. I'm busy digging. I'm busy digging. I'm putting the, the, the forklift's head in the ground. And as it's in, I stop and something says to me, where's the gas line? And I'm thinking, yes, I've never even thought about gas lines. I wonder where these things run, right? It's my first time doing this. So I call, I call the city. They send me a plan of where the gas line is. Do you know where the gas line was? Exactly. To the inch where the head of the... Now, don't tell me that it was me thinking in my back. This is, you know, something came up in me. Think about your gas line. <laughs> it wasn't. This is God directing. So, so what was I busy doing while I was digging? Praying. I was sitting, praying, praying in tongues, just praying, thanking God for this amazing property. Thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that I can be doing what I'm doing. Thank you that you're conducting me. Where's the gas line? <laughs> it's in the smallest season. Thank you, God, that I can dig today. Thank you that it's awesome that you're part of my digging. Thank you that you're part of me putting a pipe in. Thank you that you're part of this electrical work that I'm doing. Um, thank you that you're part of, of the service that I'm planning. Thank you that you're going to be in the midst of it. Thank you that you're part of this meal that I'm making. Thank you that you're part of this basket that I'm putting together because you're going to show and conduct me. And while you're doing it, God's going to say, you know what? I want you to change this because this person's going through this. He says, my sheep will hear my voice. You will hear his voice. It's his will. He wants you to hear his voice. But unless we start involving him in every detail, he'll stay on the side. Not because he doesn't want to be involved, but he says, I've given you a will and I will not overthrow your will. I will be involved. If you want me in there, I'm going to be in there. So it's in our conduct every single day while we're walking, while we're driving. Thank, can we pray for God for direction? Yes, we can. Thank you, God, that I'm driving the best possible route that I can get there. I pray for this driver next to me. He's going to be awake. I pray for this traffic light. It's going to be... Uh, all these things matter. How involved is he? So, so this morning, I'm working, walking through the aisles, and, and this is kind of fresh in my heart. And as I'm busy walking, I start thinking, okay, now, I'm going to start involving God in the most simplest of details there possibly is. I'm going to involve him in every, the slightest little thing, because can you imagine him being in everything instead of just the big things? Thank you, God, for my relationships. Thank you for my friendships. Um, thank you for my, for my dog. Actually, I prayed for my chickens this morning. Thank you, God, for my chickens. They're good chickens. I, I thank you that, that they, they listen well and, and, and they eat. And thank you that they, they make incredible eggs. And I thank you for our puppy, Anley. Thank you that she's healthy and strong and she's our guard dog. And, and I thank you for... Um, yeah, I thank you for Lene. I'm thanking you for, for her sleeping patterns and that she sleeps well and she's obedient and she listens and she eats well. Whatever we put in front of her, thank you that, that, that she's, she's a good eater. Thank you for my kids that they're healthy and strong. Not just that they're healthy and strong. Thank you for Kaylee and Andrew that they will do well in math. And thank you that you are involved in it. Thank you that they will invite you in also and that I'm not just inviting you on their behalf. 
Um, thank you, God, that you're in my finances, some financial decisions that I have to make. But even in my spending for Christmas gifts, thank you that you're part of my wallet. You're in my wallet, and I'm going to be wise with how I conduct myself in it. Thank you that, that, that you're part of my friendship relationships that I'm surrounding. Who I buy a coffee for this week? Who am I going to take out? I'm going to spend my time with it. Thank you. You're going to be in my conversation. Thank you that you're going to be part of what I'm going to watch on TV and what I'm going to listen to in the day. Thank you that you're involved in every. Do I, God, I'm going to, this week, what do you want me to do for my health this week? Thank you, God, that this week I'm going to start exercising and you're going to remind me in the mornings that I have to get up and start doing something to become healthy in my life. Thank you, God, you're involved in every area of it. Every area of it. Involve Him in every area of your life. And God's will becomes known in thanksgiving. It is, God, God's got incredible plans. He's got incredible plans for us. Every single one of you. His plans are good. His ways, He's going to make known to you. He said, I'll lead you and I guide you. Be patient. He said that, that um, my path is made known in patience. Be patient. Know that He won't be late. He's not going to show up late. He's not going to miss a deadline. If you want to know his will, ask him. Be meek. Be powerful. But be willing to submit to his directing. Feed on him every day. Every morning. Every day, feed on him. Don't skip a day. Don't think that yesterday's food is going to be enough for the next two days. Every day in your conversation, God's will will be made known to you. Amen. Let's pray.